Hi everyone, welcome to episode two of the Racers Edge Live, coming to you from London, from lockdown London. I hope you're all getting along okay. Began the show last uh, last week, well it wasn't actually a week ago, but a few days ago, by giving a big shout out to everybody out there on the front line who's helping and working to try and improve the situation. Again, repeat that of course. Tonight, Thursday indeed, um, we're going to be, uh, excuse me, just got to turn down the volume here. Everybody's um, going to be out there on the balconies here, out in the streets, clapping our NHS here in the UK. They've done a brilliant job. And, um, you know, forevermore, we're going to be grateful to them. I know that. Just on that note, um, since we last spoke, I'm just looking down because I just want to kill the audio on my mobile phone. Excuse me for one second. Um, well, I'm still going to keep talking, of course. Um, on that note, it's really impressive, I think, to have seen that uh, we've already had a response from the Formula One industry to the issue of ventilators and, and the, work, the global shortage of ventilators. And none other than the Mercedes Formula One team, surprise, surprise, involved in the reverse engineering of this CPAP device. That's the continuous positive airways pressure device, which doesn't actually involve a ventilator, but keeps the air mixed with oxygen pumping into the lungs. What a fabulous thing. I'd love to have been, <laughs> love to have been a fly on the wall when the interface was going on between University College of London and Mercedes Formula One team on that. Um, and look at the color of the nomenclature on the, on the actual mast. Is that aquamarine from Petronas? I can't believe that it's that, it's that switched on these days in terms of PR, but um, I thought that was a nice touch if that indeed is the case. Um, there's no Petronas branding there, of course, or Mercedes or AMG, but lovely to see that. And I know now they're looking for more engineering input for testing as well. So who knows, maybe some F1 teams, other F1 teams, even Mercedes again, uh, will be involved in that. Um, and I think this just, you know, no surprises that Mercedes have come up with that. And this is, you can see why <laughs> they win so many races and so many world championships. If they're that switched on and they can move that quickly into something like this, then that kind of explains it all, doesn't it? I'm sure many other Formula One teams are similarly agile, but this is really impressive to see and full marks to them. What can you say? It kind of makes one feel not proud, it's the wrong word, but feel good about being part of the Formula One world and how quickly we can move on things like this. Uh, since we last spoke also, I think Bernie Eccleston has said that in his, if he was running Formula One at the moment, he would just shut down 2020 completely and restart in 21. Well, I think that kind of makes sense, although he would say that, wouldn't he? Because if that actually happened, and we knew now, going forward, that the championship was going to start in 2021, there was going to be no racing at all. How would that work financially for the Formula One industry and the teams? I think at the moment, they're all assuming there's going to be some income, and they're going to try and cut their cloth accordingly as we go towards the... Um, as we go towards those races towards the back end of the year. Quite when those races will be, I have absolutely no idea. I think some people are assuming, I know Martin Brundle has said this week that he really hopes that the championship can start at Silverstone at the British Grand Prix. And as I speak, as we speak now, the British Grand Prix has not yet been postponed or canceled. It's still on its date. But with Wimbledon here in the UK, having been canceled, the big tennis event, then it's difficult to see how the British Grand Prix can now go ahead, but they're going to make a decision at the end of this month, the end of this month of April. So um, yeah, we've already got some questions coming in. Um, question from Denmark, from Leon Lawrenson. Denmark, how highly would you rate Kevin Magnussen and how are his chances to come to a top team? Um, well, you know, it's, uh, I think Kevin is, um, He's really good, isn't he? He drives really well. And there was a moment when Rob Wilson was involved in uh, quite a lot of testing when he was at McLaren and Stoffel was there and a few others. And Kevin was the guy that Rob felt had the most potential to go furthest because his touch is so light and he's very supple in the way he drives. That was the feedback back then. You know, I think he's gone off the rails periodically. Um, He's got a few, 
mental issues is completely the wrong way of phrasing it, but I think his approach to racing perhaps could be um, harnessed more. Um, I'm not saying that it's a management thing. It's probably just a mental thing. And I'm not sure that it has, he's anything more than just a really quick driver who's obviously trying to outrace and out-qualify Roman Grosjean, race in, race out. And whether that's a great thing for Kevin's long-term development, I have a slight question mark about that. I think in terms of his natural talent, he's definitely got it. I think he, you know, if he could, if he, if he was driving for Tyrrell alongside Jackie Stewart, I think he would be a great, great Grand Prix driver. You know, he could have developed in the way Francois Sever did. Um, and I think that's what Kevin needs. He needs that sort of discipline. Anyway, let's hope he he's a good guy. And, uh, you know, let's hope he goes. I'm, I'm kind of looking down at my phone when I do this. Um, just Ryan saying, thank you again. Great to see you. Um, Ian Norton, blimey. Voice is synchronized now. Well, thank you to Joe and the tech team on that one. They've been working very hard all week on uh, getting the voice sync right. It's not that easy on Skype. I, you know, you probably assume we're using Skype here. That's how we're able to get the nice finished product into the YouTube channel. And it's not that easy to get the lip sync really good unless you press all the right buttons these days. So um, uh, anyway, a further part of Ian's point is, um, I think the Formula One driver sim racing idea is a non-starter. What do you think? Well, here was I just about to say, I've never really got hold of it, but I think it's probably quite a good thing, isn't it? Because, you know, at least we're sort of kind of keeping it all going. Um, I think to me, my answer falls into two categories. One, I don't think sim training is the answer to becoming a great Grand Prix driver. I think it's really good for a number of things, but in terms of simulating accurately all the dynamic weights involved in driving a racing car, well, managing the dynamic weights, I don't think sim does the job. It, basically, it's still hand-eye. Whatever you want to do, it's ultimately hand-eye coordination, which is a really important part of a racing driver's repertoire, but it is not what it is all about. And Carlos Reutemann, who I know really well, um, senator in Argentina still, he was a little bit ill a couple of years ago, but he's okay now, and that's great news. Carlos, um, we went to the Williams factory, I guess it must have been about 10 years ago now, but their sim at that point was pretty much state of the art, and, and it still is, I think. The Williams sim is a pretty good sim. And um, we put Carlos in the simulator to, for a lap of Monaco, a circuit that he knows pretty well and has driven very well on over the years. And he did one sort of slow lap out of the pits, typical Carlos. And then, unlike Carlos, who then would have done a lap 0.2 under the lap record, he actually went even slower, I think, on his second lap. And then he pulled into the pits again and rolled up the sleeves of his shirt and said, the hairs on my arms are standing up because this is so unlike anything that driving a racing car is that I just don't want anyone to do with it and jumped out of it completely. And of course that's an extreme, but I kind of get where he's coming from. It is about feel ultimately. It's not about reactions and reflexes. And um, so in that sense, that's where I sit in terms of sim. On the other side of the fence, when you look at guys like Lando Norris, George Russell, Charles Leclerc, all the next generation, all of whom have used sims a lot in the way they've built up as racing drivers, I think putting them all together and having them compete in a Grand Prix with a few guests like Ben Stokes, who's going to be in the Sunday night one, uh, the second round of the, of the official Formula One uh, racing, e-racing, I think that's pretty good. Isn't that a good thing? I'm going to watch it. And um, I'm actually quite interested to see how Lando, who I'm assuming is probably as good as it gets when it comes to an F1 driver using a sim really well, using these games really well. Um, Lando's that sort of guy, isn't he? Um, I'm interested to see how he gets on alongside Nicky Latifi, Charles Leclerc, George Russell. Um, and I think that in itself is quite an interesting thing, I think. I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to give an answer after the Sunday one when I really watched one for the first time. But on this subject, um, Tiago Montero is a really good buddy of mine, and he is just um, doing his own race. And it's going to be on just after the show. So get over to Felix de Costa's YouTube channel after this, if you feel like it, and watch the show they're doing. That involves people like Juan Pablo Montoya um, and other friends like that, of that ilk. So it's going to be really good, I think, that one. A lot of fun anyway. 
So here we are, you know, in the in this situation, this dreadful situation, and I think it's probably quite a good thing that we do have e-racing at the moment. And although Liberty, I think, have really, really messed up on the Australian Grand Prix, as I said in the last show, I think they've done a very good job. And all the work they've done on the e-racing side and all the work they've done over the last couple of years on that is paying off in terms of keeping the fans kind of happy. Um, so there we are, sim racing. Dimitris Papadopoulos, Dimitris, nice to uh, to hear you from Greece. Um, hi, mate. Keep strong and safe. Definitely keeping strong and safe best as we can. Uh, it was haircut day in the uh, Windsor household today. Nothing to do with me. I don't need haircuts anymore, as you well know. But uh, young Jack Windsor got all his hair shorn um, because we just thought it was probably the right thing to do in this situation. So anyway, he's now bald. <coughs> says the word quietly. Um, Ryan again has come back um, to continue the sim topic. Do you think it's worth the time, energy and effort for the Formula One teams to coordinate having their drivers to participate? Well, you know, in a, in a sim championship of, of sorts. Well, I think it is. Yeah, I think, you know, it is worth the effort and I think they should be. And a Formula One team is ultimately nothing more than an entity that is part of a franchise and it's a brand and it needs to be entertaining. And I said last time that wouldn't it be wonderful right now to have lots of GoPro cameras inside these factories uh, just to sort of be there, even if it's an empty room. Let's have it. This is a live meeting room in the Mercedes or McLaren factories. Let's have that. Let's touch and feel. And uh, yeah, I think it is. Um, Declan Kerrin says, there's always latency with Sims and it will never feel real. Well, that kind of endorses what I said. Now, I agree with you, Declan. Um, Edgar Wertenen, Wertenen. Hi, Peter. What do you think of the Formula One teams will have the Daz in their car when we see them racing again? I'm not sure I quite understand what you mean by that. Um, do, you, do, you, do I think there will be a lot of mods in the car? Uh, cars when they race again, what spec will they be at? Um, well, I think a good question, a good, a good thing to think about is whether or not they're all going to have the uh, Mercedes steering system. As I said last time, I think that's the most interesting thing of all because there's certainly time to do that uh, in theory. So um, let's see what happens. Um, Adam Simmons has come in. Presumably he's pro-SIM, I would have thought. As useful as they are, especially for a new circuit, you can learn to trick the system which you cannot do in a car. Well, that's typical of a young, fast, talented racing driver to have already developed a way of tricking the system. I don't know. Um, Denny says, that oh, makes me think of Denny Holm, but it's not, of course, it's Denny. Hi, Peter, is Charles Leclerc as talented as Max and Lewis? That's a really good question, isn't it? If you took Lewis out of the equation right now, I would say that Charles and Max are evolving to be the sort of Stuart and Rint of the next era. And I think Charles is the Stuart and Max is the Rint. And for those of, those of you that don't know who Stuart and Rint are, and there will be some, I guess, Stuart and Rint dominated um, racing for a very short period of time, actually, because Jochen sadly was killed well before his time. Um, but they were the epitome of speed and talent. They were the fastest things in Formula One. Jackie was the consummate pro, really, really quick, uh, very intelligent. Jochen was all reflexes, car control, competitive aggression. And it never, it was never, uh, the, the ultimate example of that was the 69 British Grand Prix, where the two of them swapped places some over 30 times in the course of the race. Um, slipstream race back then, the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, not many slow corners, no slow corners, um, but total trust between the two, total respect. They live near one another in Switzerland. They were very, very good friends and uh, their wives were good friends and they were just, they were motor racing for a very short period of brilliant time. And I think Charles and Max are at that level. I've no, I think Charles is quite capable of winning four or five Grand Prix uh, World Championships in the right team and the right car. And I think Max is too. <laughs> I can't wait um, for that era really to gather pace. Those two are absolutely outstanding. As for Lewis, of course, he's there as well, but he's of a different time frame. Um, he isn't going to be racing when Max and Charles continue their careers. 
uh, on the basis that Lewis isn't going to be racing forever. He's going to be racing for three or four years more, I would guess. Um, but I think at the moment, Lewis is possibly a combination of the two. I think he has Charles' ability to have the big picture and manage the car really well um, and manage the garage really well and manage his team really well, or what he needs to do within the team in that steward like way. But I think he also has still incredibly, despite all these wins and championships, I think he still has Max's raw Formula Renault type aggression um, and will never want to get beaten by anybody in anything. And that is so rare to have that, particularly with all these wins behind him. I think Lewis is something that we need to really appreciate and cherish, particularly with this time we've had off, um, to see just how good this guy really is. And um, I'm rambling on a bit about Lewis because um, I think it's very easy for people today in the world of social media and everything else to say, oh, he's a Lewis fan or he's not a Vettel fan or this or that. The reality is, <clears throat> whether you like Lewis or not, the guy is an unbelievably good racing driver. I did suggest in one video that Lewis perhaps has found this winter, uh, over this winter has perhaps changed mentally more than he has over others uh, in that he's just become the Lewis Hamilton that you see on the billboards as distinct from Lewis Hamilton, the racing driver, a little bit more, not completely. Um, so, but I think this, this period now will have done nothing other than bring Lewis right back to earth and it's bad news for everybody else. I think Lewis will come out of the, the gates absolutely in perfect shape. Although I did say last time, and I still stand by that, it's a short, if it's a short championship in 2020, I don't think that works in Lewis's favor. I think it works in the favor of a driver like Max. Um, anyway, there we go. Um, Tony Stevens says, oh boy, Johnny Herbert already filled the system in the last race. Well, you know more about that, Tony, than I do, but I'm not surprised old Johnny Herbert did that. Good on him. Yeah, all right, mate, why not? Um, another question from Bastian Skorsky. Who was the faster, better driver, Nicky Lauda or John Watson? Now, that's a really, really good question. Thank you for asking that. Because there was an Autosport Award thing at the London Hilton a couple of years ago, three or four years ago. John was there, Nicky was there. And I won't drop the compare in it because it's not fair, I guess, to do that. But it was all, you know, Nicky, now we've got a friend of yours who's going to join us. Here's John, what's wrong? You know, and then Nicky sort of got on it as well. And, you know, poor old John, he was. And I thought that's really not right. I mean, there were two, two standout races for John Watson, let alone winning that 81 British Grand Prix, first win for the Carbon uh, McLaren. But if you think about his wins at Long Beach and Detroit, midfield, uh, through the field, slicing his way through and beating Nicky Lauda, his teammate, on both occasions, they were superb Grand Prix wins. John Watson was, I think, a much better racing driver than anybody has ever given him credit for. I was a huge Watson fan when he was in Formula Two even, uh, with a Lotus 48. And I remember, I, I grew up in Australia, for those that may not know, um, but my sister got married in England, um, which is an excuse for me to come over when I was, you know, late teens in 71. And um, the first thing I did was make a beeline for a thing called the Motor Racing Showboat. <laughs> it was the racing car show that we used to have at Olympia actually held on a showboat, would you believe, a boat on the River Thames. And I went on to it. Um, I got a free ticket from Andrew Marriott, I think, and went on. And one of the first people I saw standing there, still with his beard, was John Watson. I went straight up and got his autograph. Because um, all I read about was Watson. Uh, I'd only read about him in Formula 2 reports written by Alan Henry. And, and he never, ever disappointed. He was a fingertip super sensitive driver, incredibly brave in bad Formula One cars. And the Surtees when he was driving, it was not a great car, but he would never ever give 100%, less than 100%. And he was always, you know, he, I feared for John because you could look at the outside loaded front of any race car that John Watson was driving. And you knew that if there was any breakage, this guy was just straight off. He was a front end driver in that sense. And you never saw him rarely, you rarely saw him out of line. And, you know, John, if you think of the 78 Swedish Grand Prix that Nicky won with the fan car, and then it was banned, and then the next race was what? The French Grand Prix at Ricard, John Watson on the pole. Brilliant. And 
at that point, there were not many, and 78 also, Monaco qualifying, he was brilliant. There are not many, from memory, it was 29-2 he did. Uh, there are not many drivers at that time who would have said that John Watson was anything other than, you know, super quick. He was just brilliant. So, you know, I think John John didn't have Nicky's um, mental approach to racing. He was nothing like as disciplined with the way he allowed his brain to work. And he was possibly, you could say, too intelligent to be a racing driver in that sense. But uh, raw speed, he was there. I think he just needed to be a lot more disciplined and tougher with himself mentally. And um, perhaps give himself more self-confidence. I don't think he was the most confident of drivers or people, but a lovely guy. Chatted to him not so long ago up in his house in Oxfordshire and um, got a lot of respect for John Watson, massive amount. Um, anyone who can drive a Lotus 48 that well has to be good, doesn't they? Nothing wrong with Lotus 48s, of course. Um, so there, there we go. I haven't really asked uh, answered the question. I guess, you know, the results say it all. Nicky wasn't bad either, was he? Um, Demisco is a great question. Which current Formula 2 or Formula 3 driver do you rate the highest? Wow, well, that's a really good question, isn't it? Um, I think, uh, you know, Oscar Piastri is looking pretty good, the young Australian. Obviously, Alex Peroni was very quick in the F3 test as well, coming back from his shunt. So some good young Aussies coming along. Um, F3 is a difficult series in which to make really good judgment because it's very expensive for young guys. You're looking at 800 million euros. Um, and so there are a lot of guys in there who are there kind of because of the money. But uh, I'll be interested to see how they get on. I think Ollie Corbel's pretty good as well. Um, let's see how he goes. F2, um, I'm a bit of a Jack Aitken fan, as you may have realized. I do quite a lot of tweets about him. And I think he's I think he's he is very quick and I, he's very intelligent. And I think he works very hard at his racing. He's driving for Campos again as well, which means he's probably not going to win a championship. But uh, last year in the Campos, he won three or four races, which is brilliant, I think. So let's see how he goes. Um, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's so difficult with F2, isn't it, to be... Because I've been a Latifi fan all these years, and I just, you know, I could never understand why he wasn't given a more of a an opportunity i'm glad he's at williams now that's brilliant well let's see how he goes um you know it's uh it's going to be good i love f2 f3 i find it very disappointing that whenever i do an interview with an f2 or f3 driver or talk about it it doesn't get a massive number of views but to me f2 and f3 is just as interesting as formula one i just love motor racing and um i don't know why that would has to be really, you know, the pressure is on always to do F1 stuff, but F2, F3, I think there's some really, really good guys there and um, really looking forward to it, actually. It's, uh, you know, two good categories. I think Euro Formula Open is going to be really good as well, so we need to include that. Watch it, definitely. Haven't really answered all the questions there. I need to think about it a bit more, I guess. Um, Emmanuel Boating says, if Fernando wins the Indy 500, Will he open pathways for IndyCar drivers to come and do Formula One just the same way Formula One drivers um, do IndyCars and achieve success on both sides of the Atlantic? Um, um, yeah, probably. I think F1 drivers, as time goes on, more and more, they're wary of ovals, aren't they? I think that's the problem. And the more they race on these super circuits with massive runoff, the less inclined they're going to want to do an oval race in America, unless there's no option. In Fernando's case, it's slightly different because he really wants to win the, win the Indy 500 for the Triple Crown, um, fair enough. But I, I don't see that opening the doors for the modern Formula One driver because I think they'll just think, why? You know, why do I need to put my right life at risk on an oval? And I think that'll be the philosophy. But I think you'll see quite a lot of F1 guys that should be there or have been there going over and doing as many road races as they can. I was interested to see that Linus Lundqvist has, um, he was pretty good, won British Formula 3, did Euro Formula Open last year, couldn't find the budget to move up to FIA Formula 3, no surprise given the amounts of money we've just talked about. 
Uh, and he's now gone and going over there to do Road to Indy. He's effectively racing the category below Indy Lights um, to get on their scholarship system. And good luck to him. I hope he makes it through that. And from his perspective, if he has to do ovals as part of that, I'm sure he'll do it. It's the F1 drivers, I'm saying, may not want to switch to ovals as readily. Um, I'm just going to reboot this uh, live chat thing to make sure that I'm not missing out. Um, so I hope that kind of answers that question. Um, Peter's cap somehow makes him look like a MotoGP rider. Well, that's good news. I've always wanted to look like a MotoGP rider, even if I'm not. I have had a few bikes in my time, and I love riding bikes. Um, well, I'm winding back a bit now that I'm a dad. Um, but, of course, this is a Globe cap. And Globe is a company very close to my heart. They've been very helpful with everything I've ever done online. And I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for Globe. So great company, great skateboards. They're doing a new electric skateboard. I uh, had a look at it when I was out there in Melbourne and um, great clothing and shoes and everything else, as you probably know. So if you haven't seen it, go to their website. Um, another question from Damisco. Additionally to the question you mentioned, the Campos more is a bad car compared to others. How big is the difference between the teams in Formula 2? Well, I don't think, have to, I don't think you could ever say the Campos is a bad car. It's not. It's a, they produce very good cars and they um, set them up really well. And they've got some very good results in F2 and F3. I think the difference is the amount of work you do behind the scenes. If you've got a, if you've got a, if you're a Prima or an ART and you've got a full budget from both drivers, in the case of F2, you've got your two and a half, three million euros for the team for the year. Uh, and for the F3 team, you've got your two million euros. There's a lot of stuff you can do behind the scenes. They're very restrictive on, on testing, of course, in F2 and F3, but there are a lot of things you can do. I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> Um, and that's where it shows. That's where it shows. And, and, and if you're a Campos driver on a limited budget, you're going to be turning up, having just done sim work and nothing else, and then climbing into your car to do a 30-minute untimed practice and then a 30-minute qualifying, which will probably be interrupted by a red flag at some point, giving you maybe one or two laps to do a qualifying time. And that's why it's so difficult. And that's where the Premers and ARTs have the advantage. They have more knowledge they have more understanding of the setup of the car they can dig deeper into the well when the variables come into play and there's no magic in that that's the way motor racing has always been of course they're all Dallara's they're all powered by the same engines uh, so race on race you could say that Campos can build a can produce a very good car not only Campos but other teams like them but ultimately it is when the variables come in that the the very good well financed teams actually show their merit um I mentioned last time I went off on a sort of tangent talking about Giancarlo Baghetti winning a Formula 3 race in 67, five years after he'd won, six years after he'd won three, four Formula 1 races in a row in one year. Um, so this year's, this, this show's tangent is going to be about a, well, it's triggered by a tweet put out by my friend Stuart Codling. I'll put his tweet in the description for this video and YouTube later on. Codder's good bloke loves his motorsport and he tweeted yesterday or the day before that it was x number of years 70 i think probably now 60 don't even want to think about it uh, years since the scarab f1 car the first american formula one car raced in europe and so i thought yeah well that's pretty good isn't it a scarab it, it was a it was such a shame that they came in uh, right at the end of the or the beginning of the rear engine formula, or the rear engine trend in Formula One. They came into Formula One in 5960, just like Aston Martin has to be said, with a really good front engine car, uh, but it was just non-starter in effect, because by then we had rear engine Coopers and Lotuses showing everybody how it should have gone. But a massive amount of money was spent by the man behind Scarab, which was an American driver called Lance Reventlo. Now, Lance is a story in himself, a bit like the current Lance, probably. Um, but Lance was the, was the son of Barbara Hutton, who was an heir to the, or the heir to the Woolworth department store fortune. So Barbara Hutton was worth back in the 50s, $50 million, a lot of money back then. And Lance was given something like $15 million to start up a race team that he wanted to, uh, he just loved racing. He was big mates with James Dean. It's a great story, actually, just listen. And um, so he set up a shop in on Venice Boulevard, near Venice Beach in California. 
And he had such players as Von Dutch doing his livery. He later worked for Steve McQueen. Uh, Ken Miles was involved. Phil Remington, who later became the great mechanic at, at Eagles and Gurney, uh, was there as well. Carol Shelby, too. And they built these amazing Scarab sports cars, which very quickly won quite a lot of races. So Lance, being the guy, the guy that he was, and he was known as a bit of a playboy as well, uh, decided that he had to do Formula One and he had to do a Scarab Formula One car and it wouldn't use the Climax engine. He would do his own engines. And he, so he did a car with a desmodromic valve engine, beautiful front engine car, and uh, took it to Europe. It was a bit slow in getting it going, but took it to Europe for 1960. They were actually based quite near here, I think, in um, near Shepherd's Bush, near where I am here in London, in, in, in the same area where the Scirocco... Uh, Formula One team were based in the mid 60s. That sort of was a really big area for Formula One around here. So that's where Scarab were based. And they did their first race with Chuck Day in the other car. Chuck was another very good technical guy, very good engine guy, but a very, very quick racing driver as well. So it was Chuck Day and Lance Reventler driving these Scarabs, beautiful blue, metallic blue that Von Dutch had given them. Still the best color, I think, ever for a Grand Prix car. And the first outing was Monaco, and neither of them qualified, but in the process of not qualifying, amazingly, Lance asked Sterling Moss if he would do a few laps in the Scarab around Monaco. And Sterling, guess what, said, yeah, absolutely. Got in the car, did a half dozen laps, and um, got out of it and said, well, it feels like a libo, old boy. And he said, what do you mean? What do you mean? Um, well, well, com compared with a modern Formula One car, it felt like a limousine if compared with a Cooper or a Lotus. And uh, so that sort of was the writing on the wall for what that Scarab was all about. It was too heavy. It had a Corvette-based gearbox, I think. It was completely overtaken by events in terms of its design. But they did go to Spa. They went to Zandvoort. They went to Spa. And they both drivers actually made it to the grid of the Belgian Grand Prix in 1960. And that was the race, of course, that we lost both Alan Stacey and Chris Bristow on the same day. And Sterling Moss in practice had his horrendous accident in the Lotus 18 when the rear suspension broke. So that was a momentous race, the, uh, the Belgian Grand Prix. And actually just on that subject, the Dutch Grand Prix, uh, two weeks before 1960, um, one of the Scarabs, I think made it through, I think Chuck Day made it through, but that race was memorable for two things. An amazing dice between Jack Brabham and Sterling Moss, with Sterling sitting behind, Jack was in the factory Cooper, Sterling was in the Rob Walker Lotus 18, and Sterling was just shadowing Jack up to about lap 18, I think it was, and Jack went over an apex curve, as you would, as Jack always did, and threw up a, a block, literally a brick, the size of a brick, as hard as a brick, and it, and it just came straight back into Sterling's Lotus 18. Luckily, hit a front tire. I say luckily, it didn't hit him in the head. Um, and Sterling was on a quick corner at the time. I think it was the corner onto the main straight. Uh, so he was doing 120, 125 miles an hour. Front tire blew. Sterling held the moment, came into the pits, lost about three minutes because Lotus, of course, had gone away from the central locking steering wheel with the lovely central locker uh, to the to the lighter wheels and they had to undo all the bolts, the wobbly wheels. And so it was three minutes before he got back into the race and he worked his way up to third place or thereabouts in that race. Brilliant drive from Sterling Moss. Jack went on to win the race. And afterwards, somebody said to Sterling, well, you can't win, can you? Um, Sterling said in reply, he said, you know, everybody's saying I, I push too hard and that's why quite a lot of the cars that I drive don't finish the race. So in this one, I sat back behind Jack and look what happened. <laughs> I'm not going to do that anymore. Anyway, the next race, of course, he had that massive shunt um, for which he recovered. Um, and so that was that. Anyway, going back to the Lance Reventlow story, he continued. They did the US Grand Prix that year at Riverside and Chuck Day actually, by today's parlance, would have finished in the points. He finished 10th amazingly in the American Grand Prix in a, in a Scarab. So full marks to, to him for that. And Lance, um, very sad, actually. He was, you know, he was obviously a rich kid that loved his motor racing, and he was of the James Dean ilk. And his mum had seven husbands, would you believe. Uh, Lance was a product of the second marriage. He, it was with the Danish count, obviously with the surname Reventler. 
The third marriage was with Cary Grant. And Cary Grant, the actor, really took to Lance and loved Lance's ambition to build a race team and um, became very much a part of that whole dream with Lance. Sadly, the marriage didn't last too much longer um, or too long. Anyway, Lance, um, when the Scarab first ran, he commissioned a amazing for the times, really, when you think about it. He commissioned a video to be made or a film to be made about the first laps he drove in the Scarab at the Riverside Circuit when it was completely empty on his own. And the film was made. It was made by a guy called um, Bruce Kessler. And it won awards. It's about 15 minutes long. You can find it on YouTube now. It's called The Sound of Speed. There's no dialogue at all. It's all engine noise. There's a bit of music. And it's really, really good. You see the scarab going around Riverside. And I tell you what, that's Lance Sorrentlo driving. And I tell you what, if you look at his car control and some of the angles he's getting the car, and he has a couple of spins as well, this guy was not slow. Absolutely not. And um, I really enjoyed it. So there you go. That's that tangent. For, oh, you might want to know what happened to Lance. Sadly, 72, he, um, he was a, a very good pilot, but oddly on this occasion, he was being flown by a young student, not a student pilot, but a young student who had his PPL in a single engine Cessna in Aspen, Colorado. They were doing a property deal and he was looking at some new property and in bad weather, they went down and they were all killed 72. So and that was terrible. And Barbara Hutton herself went in a rapid decline in the later years of her life and sadly passed away um, with very little money left and not in great health either. So a, a tragic end to it all. But Scarab, you know, what an amazing story within this amazing world we have of Formula One. Anyway, let's see if we can um, reboot my mobile phone and see if we can get some more uh, questions going. Um, Tony Stevens says, Peter, I agree with you on Formula Two, Formula Three racing. It's just as if not more entertaining than a lot of Formula One racing with more slicing and dicing than in Formula One. Well, I kind of made this point last time, didn't I? That I'd love to see the midfield of Formula One spiced up by having the option of buying a template Formula One car and, and effectively making what we see in Formula Two, the midfield of Formula One, obviously much quicker, needs to be a proper F1 car, but we need that parity and we need the cost to be controlled in such a way that it, it comes in at the production level. And that's where that's why I keep saying, I think we need to have that option to have a template Formula One car. Keep the options open for anybody that wants to design and build their own car like Mercedes, Ferrari, Red Bull, no problem with that. But we should have the option to buy something like a Delara F2 car in F1 form. And then we would get that racing in the midfield. And probably we'd have a lot more overtaking, I think. Um, people used to say, you know, it's really difficult to overtake in F2 even, but don't forget Artem Markolov, another driver I think very underrated and should be given a proper F1 opportunity. He's doing F2 again this year. I think Luca Giotto is another driver that I'd love to see progress out of F2 as well, really talented. Just starting to think about all the drivers that uh, that I rate there. But Artem, you know, Abu Dhabi two years ago, sector three passed seven cars in two races. Sector three is pretty tight in Abu Dhabi. And that just shows what you can do, A, in an F2 car, and B, if you're Artem Markolov. Um, we've got a question from James Hobson. How will the current situation and rule deferral affect driver contracts? Well, I would assume, this is only me assuming it, that everything is kind of frozen, is it not, at the moment? And that I think it would be difficult if a team wanted to change a legal obligation to anybody as a result of the coronavirus situation. I think it'll be really difficult for anybody to fight that battle legally once we all get back into uh, normal life again, and which is what we're really talking about, isn't it? So I think you freeze everything as it is, and then you press go again when the barriers are lifted. That's how I would see it happening. And I, I guess that's the way Formula One's going to work. Um, Horatio 156 says, how sad, great story, Peter. Well, yeah, it was sad. You know, let's, we're talking about Scarab and Lance Reventler now because, um, you know, it just shows, isn't it? Money 
as Cindy Lauper always used to say, money. I've got to tell you a great Cindy Lauper song, actually, uh, story. Um, and I hope I'm not showing my age too much here. And I hope even you young guys out there know who Cindy Lauper is, because she is very cool. She hasn't been that well recently, so very best wishes to Cindy out there. But when she was really big and she did, she did Girls Must Want to Have Fun and then she did Time After Time, I remember I was driving back from, I was working at Autocar at the time. I was driving back from Sutton back into London. I was listening to the radio and they said, oh, Cindy Lauper's live in London tonight. And she was live in a weird place near Oldwich, a sort of hall near Oldwich. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the Albert Hall. It wasn't anywhere that you'd normally imagine. Um, and so I went there and I got there early. It was about seven o'clock because I've still, you know, I'd just come from work. So I went in there and then sure enough, about eight o'clock, the whole, all the lights went out and there was a bit of food and the music started and, and we were all, and then Cindy Lauper just appeared on stage and, um, and there weren't that many people there. There must have been only about 50 people. And she was there. The band was there. And she was big at the time. And anyway, she started doing um, Girls Want to Fun and then Time After Time. And I was just sort of dancing. I was down there at the stage looking up Cindy Lauper. Time after time. And she came down off the stage and started to dance with me. Can't believe it. Now, it seems incredibly stupid, isn't it? But anyway, it happened. It actually happened. I've got another great story along those lines, actually. Um, British Open one year. Um, I was up there because I got to know Greg Norman pretty well in the Nigel Mansell, Greg Norman golfing days. And Greg invited me up to the British Open and we we're having dinner on the Saturday night of the Open at Greg's long table in the restaurant in the clubhouse. Mega thing. Must have been about 20 people there. And Greg had just made a video, an instructional video. And hit the guy who had made it, really good friend of Greg's, was sitting on his right. And on his left was his wife, the video guy's wife. And I was sitting next to her. And we were chatting away as you do. And I said, oh, you know, what do you do? She said, oh, you know, I, I run the house, but I do a bit of movie making sometimes. I said, oh, really? What, what sort of stuff do you do? And she said, uh, she said, oh, well, you know, you wouldn't have seen any of it, but I've just made a film actually with um, Michael Douglas. And it's about a guy that has an affair and then his wife goes crazy. And, um, you know, it goes on from there. I'm sure it'll never make it to England, so I won't even go on. And anyway, it was Anne Archer who played, of course, the, the wife in Fatal Attraction. There she was saying, I don't think anyone will even see it in England. So I sat next to her when that one was going on. Mega, eh? Um, right, Carlos Frad, a very serious question here. If we compare Formula One and MotoGP, Moto2 and Moto3 have much more exposure than F2 and F3. Moto2 and F3 have many followers, much more than F2 and F3. Absolutely right. And, you know, it's so annoying, and I'm going to repeat the point, that we don't have more publicity and more interest and enthusiasm around F2 and F3. It's almost that, you know, if I, if I interview the winner of the F2 race, I know I'm going to get, you know, maximum two and a half, three thousand views. But if I do something on F1, and it's interesting, you know, once a year, Peter, um, I'll get a few more views than that. And it's and that's just ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous because F2 and F3 is, you know, it's all about racing drivers. There's no difference between the guy winning the F2 race and most of the guys in Formula One. And it's all to do with social media and, and image and understanding. You know, it, it's, it's summed up by the fact that if you'd done an interview with Lando Norris three years ago, it wouldn't have done very well. You do one now and immediately it'll get lots of hits. There's something wrong there, isn't there? Because there are so many good drivers in F2 and F3. So what do Moto, Moto GP do differently? Well, they've never, they've never had a policy of not trying to give the lesser categories as much publicity as possible. Whereas we have in motorsport, there was a long term policy when Bernie was running the sport that Formula One should have all the glory and the less that we talk about F3000 and F2 or GP3 or GP2, uh, the better for Formula One. And that has kind of permeated on right through to today. I think Liberty, if you spoke to them, would say, well, they do say, oh, no, we'd like to give a lot more to F2 and F3. But do they? Do they actually do more for F2 and F3 than we've ever had in the past? I don't think they do, really. And I think it's a great shame. It's a great shame. And I think it's all because of that historical historical weight that we've always placed on Formula One because that's where we want the money to be. That's where we need everything to be in order to make it work. That's the, the philosophy. Whereas MotoGP have never had that philosophy. It's this is the pinnacle. This is just below it. This is just below it. They're all great. Let's go motor racing or motorcycle racing. And 
Yeah, I hope that changes. I really hope it changes. And I hope that F2 and F3 drivers are seen a lot more, given a lot more publicity by the F1 teams, even if they're not contracted to those teams. And, um, you know, I suppose one of the things is that whenever the F2 race is on or the F3 race, the F1 people are always doing something more important. They're always having a big press conference or they're doing their debriefs or doing something. All that's wrong as well. You know, it, it's everybody should be out there watching those young guys racing. I mean, when Nigel was racing Formula 3 in the Unipart March in 79, I can remember going up to Colin Chapman and saying, you've got to come with me now, Colin, down to Woodcote. Carlos, you come as well. Come and watch this guy. This guy is really, really good. You've got to watch him under breaking at Woodcut. And sure enough, Colin said, okay, I'm with you, and just came straight down. Colin Chapman, Carlos Royden and me watching from the Woodcut chicane with me saying, look, look at Nigel coming in here. It's absolutely brilliant. Look at the way he's going. You can't do that anymore because they're not around. Having said that, I thought it was really cool to see Max Verstappen on the pit wall um, when the only action we ever saw in Melbourne, well, I saw in Melbourne, which was the S- 5,000 qualifying was taking place and James Davison was a big mate of Max Verstappen's and Max was on the pit wall sort of you know giving him dirty signals every time James went past I thought that was very nice and good to see you know that's real motor racing for me and Max is a real racer anyway he's not he's not one for all these ridiculous meetings all the time he's a good bloke and he loves racing and he and it's interesting that he's mates with James Davo because um they're just racers they met I think at some Red Bull party somewhere, well, probably in America, Austin, I guess. And um, they've been mates ever since. And James is a really good driver, brilliant at Indy, brilliant at whatever he does. He races, um, he's with, uh, is it David Bird, I think? Um, runs him in midgets and he's driven some sprint cars. He's really quick in everything he does. A lot of time for the whole Davison family, actually, all related, of course, to Lex Davison, who won several Australian Grand Prix, great gentleman driver, a gentleman driver. He was a wealthy man who put his money into motor racing and won a lot of races. And uh, Lex, Lex's dynasty, just amazing. A number of good Davos out there now. Uh, lots of them. So, yeah, that's, um, that's it's amazing how one thing goes, uh, leads to another in all these things. Um, so, have a look. Um, Next question, Mike, I'd like to know more about the Formula One engineers that are designing the ventilators. Well, I would too. This is a good example, isn't it? I'd love to have had the GoPro cameras there when Mercedes were sitting around reverse engineering one of these uh, CPAP devices and coming up with a few things that nobody had ever heard of. Isn't that a great moment? That should have been out there. Maybe it is out there, but um, yeah, I'd like to know more. All I know at the moment is that it's Mercedes. I would assume James Allison said quite a lot to do with it because he's got such a fertile brain uh, but of course so many others have too jeff willis a uh, good example um but there are plenty of guys at mercedes i've never even heard of never met i know that mike costin's grandson probably grandson works there as well he's probably brilliant but i've never met him um, which is part of the whole formula one let's keep everything secret bring the barriers down stuff but um, yeah, there's so many good guys there. I think it's just amazing what they're doing right now. I'd love to, you know, love sitting down with anybody really good in Formula One with a great engineering brain and love to see them, how they would solve a problem like this and see how their brains tick. Paddy Lowe would be another, be really good at this. Uh, Frank Durney would be one. Um, Day Wu is the name of this one. Championship at Goodwood, six events, alternate 500, Formula Three, Formula Junior, less carbon, less cost, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was watching all the Goodwood stuff over the weekend, streaming. Um, it was wonderful, wasn't it? I couldn't believe how sideways they were getting those Mustangs, those 65 Mustangs, those Henry Mann, Alan Mann Mustangs. Look superb. But yeah, you know, all that racing. Um, yeah, and I made the point, I don't know where I made the point. I think it was in an article I wrote the other day for the BRDC Bulletin about what drivers are doing at the moment with their social media. And this is gonna take a little bit of time to talk about, so bear with me. Um, hopefully we're not gonna be so late that we miss the Antonio Felix da Costa, Tiago Montero e-race, which is starting, I think, pretty soon. And if you're leaving now to go to that, I don't mind at all because they're good blokes and all the money for that is being raised for COVID-19 uh, charities in Portugal. Anyway, just on this story, um, and I, this will probably get expanded and expanded, but I think it's very easy for young drivers today to do Instagram, Twitter maybe, but Instagram and Facebook certainly, 
and to be pretty clever and pretty funny and pretty good on all of those. And therefore, amongst their peers, to feel pretty good and pretty confident about life. I don't think that's the answer. I don't think that's good use of social media. I think good use of social media is YouTube. And I think it's putting stuff out there that is real about their careers, ups and downs, the ins and outs, the bad days, the good days, filming it all. And and I and I put to put that into context, how much do you think today we would enjoy watching if Jim Clark had had GoPro cameras and his own mobile phone camera, if they'd existed back then, in the early 50s when he was driving Sunbeam Talbots over the roads of Scotland or having his first drive in a Lotus Elite at Brands Hatch or if we'd been with Ayrton Senna as he was driving home after winning the Macau Formula 3 race and he was filming going into his house, sitting down and talking into a camera about his hopes and aspirations and what it meant to win Macau and what a great circuit it was. Wouldn't that be captivating, brilliant video if that, that had actually happened? Or Scari, Nuvolari. If we had all that on video, it, it would be brilliant. We have it today. We have the opportunity to do that. And yet none of the young drivers are taking advantage of it. That's what I don't understand. You know, I want to see film of what Alex Albon's expression looked like when he got that phone call from Helmut Marco saying... Forget about Formula E, Alex. We want you to drive for Toro Rosso. I want to see that on film. And that, sh that, sh that should have been there. Alex should have been filming his life in the same way all young drivers should be filming their lives and putting them on YouTube. And if they did that, I think by the time they got to F3 and F2, the public at large would know much more about them. They'd either like them or not like them. Doesn't matter which. You've got to have likes and dislikes in order to move forward as a fan as a sport. And if we had that, there would be much more support for younger drivers. But they're not doing it because they're encouraged to do these rather trite, Instagram-y, Facebook-y things that don't actually amount to anything other than aren't I being clever and aren't I being funny, which is what they all appear to want to be seen to be. And that's my rant for the day. I think there'll be quite a lot of responses to that. And I'm sure that many of you will disagree. But for me, Having a YouTube channel, which is why I'm here now, because I love it, is tantamount to having your own TV station. And that is something that a million billion athletes, still alone race drivers, over the last 50 years would have loved to have had. We have it now. So let's hope that we get more drivers using YouTube as the medium of the future, because to me, that's the only way to tell the story. Um, Denny again. Peter, what do you think about Scott McLaughlin, two-time champ in supercars, impressed Chiefs in the IndyCar test? Yeah, really good. I have to say, I don't know that much about him, but he's obviously really good. Um, so all I can say is Scott. M.A. Um, Smith. Hello, Peter. With this season looking more like the 60s with the amount of races being held, <laughs> I think you're really being optimistic there. Um, how about a super season with 2021 like the WEC did? Well, I actually suggested that uh, in the last episode of this, episode one, because, yeah, in golf, PGA, we have the same thing. We have these wraparound championships now. The problem is, how do you get out of that back into the annual calendar again? That's a bit more difficult to do. So on the basis that Formula One has done a very good job over the years of being the only sport in the world that has a world championship that begins at the beginning of the year and ends at the end of the year, every year, do we want to lose that? I'm not sure we do. I think that's been such a part of our USP that it should be protected. That's, you know, that's that's one side of the coin. The other is, yeah, you know, why not do the overlap thing? Personally, if I think about it more and more, I think the overlap championship, the wraparound championship is a bit annoying and a bit irritating. I find it, I find, I find in the golf, I mean, I watch the American golf quite a lot and you find that the the first seven or eight rounds, championship rounds that are played at the end of the, at the beginning of the new season, in other words, from October through to December, are not usually very well supported by all the top players. And it's usually some other guys that come along and do quite well and they get a lot of points, Amex points and stuff, FedEx, sorry. Um, but, you know, so I'm not sure it would work for us in the same way. 
probably, I don't know. It's an interesting question, the whole thing. There's no doubt about it. Um, how long, we'll be going almost an hour, so I think probably we should stop now. You know, just um, a big thank you to everybody for, I hope you're enjoying this. You know, I certainly love um, meeting you guys, chatting on, on the internet and asking questions, answering questions. I'm going to ask some of you guys soon as well, I think, and um, I'm making a few points. And it's a privilege to do so. But in the meantime, um, again, a massive big thank you to everybody out there who's doing what they should be doing at this time. It's easy for me to say that. You know, I've got a family. Obviously, we try to do as much as we can here. But there are many, many more people who are really, really um, out there helping in society and doing what they're doing. And um, this is an amazing time. Oh, it brings tears to your eyes, actually, when you see some of the the humanity that is developing. I've got a list here of anything else. I'm just wondering, oh yeah, Mike Halewood's birthday today. Thanks to Matt Bishop for that. And he's wonderful on this day series that he has on Twitter. I'll put Matt's and Stuart Codling's uh, Twitter addresses on the description here because both of those guys should be followed. Mike Halewood, what a wonderful driver, what a wonderful man, funny guy, very underrated racing driver as well. Should have won four or five Grand Prix, brilliant in Formula 5000 and sports cars. Um, miss him sadly um, and don't forget Sunday night you're going to have the second of these uh, online races and it features Charles Leclerc, Alex Albon Landon Norris, Nicky Latifi and George Russell you notice I call him Nicky Latifi um, it's just to annoy him a little bit because apparently he does like to be called Nicholas but I do know a little bit, I know his mum and dad and they call him Nicky so there you go what can I say I think it's quite, um, I think Nikki Latifi's quite good or annoying, whatever you want to be. Anyway, thanks for watching. See you again soon.